unless a breach, you just can't tell anybody. There are options to notify in public ways. Um, but uh, there are some limited exceptions as well. So if, uh, if you do want to rely on one of the limited exceptions not to disclose, and there are some around that may actually do more harm, and there's some sensible limitations in there, I'm happy to talk to the Commission about it and notify them. So certainly you can't go, oh, let's just try and use this exemption and just keep it quiet. But actually, if you want to do it, you have to come talk to the Commission. Come on down. Sorry, I won't invite them to the bottom. So that's manual reporting. It's coming in. Um, different tests. Uh, you've got a little bit of time frames. Um, we do certain things. Uh, it's all stipulated in terms of what you have to disclose, which is the kinds of detail. And certainly, um, you've got a bit of time, but updating your policies on, on how you go through this will be quite an important um, step for businesses to take. Uh, one of the other areas where there's quite a big change is around strengthening the cross-border data flows. Um, essentially, New Zealand agencies can't disclose to other um, jurisdictions, entities in other jurisdictions, unless this test is met. But it very much moves the approach in New Zealand. So it's the concept that you can't just send off your um, information to some random road country that has no privacy law, essentially the answer. Um, it would be quite a bad thing to do under even existing law, because basically there are some obligations on you to take petitions, but this is just really starting out. Um, I likened the Privacy Act prior to this um, sort of recent round of amendments to essentially being hit for the wet bus ticket. Um, and this is probably the biggest area of change. I would say it's now sort of a wet piece of cardboard rather than a bus ticket. It's still compared to worldwide, I mean, you would have seen the headlines of GDPR, you know, it's a 20 million year old, 4% of worldwide turnover the higher of the two, um, which has probably got um, some of the large organisations that are concerned. Uh, we're looking at up to $10,000, so still slightly laughable. It's a big jump though from where we are, so really at the moment it's, it's pretty toothless. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that does go up, and I would not be surprised if this is the first round of, um, of um, changes to the, to the law, and then we'll be working on second one. It's really important. I spoke to a few of you at the beginning. Um, it's really important we get these changes through because we need to keep our um, state harvest status, particularly for EU. So these are 2011 requirements that we really need it. They kind of get us to there, and we've, we're hanging on to that state harvest status for EU um, data portability by the skin of our teeth, really. Um, so this will just be the first of many changes, I'm sure. Um, one of the other areas, um, obviously, is around the Privacy Commission and some powers. At the moment, if you've ever dealt with the Privacy Commissioner, they are an awesome educator. They've got great sight, um, they're really friendly, lovely, but they can't do much, um, really, unless it's really, you know, really bad. Uh, generally, it goes to the Human Rights Tribunal, and so it sort of bypasses the Privacy Commissioner. Um, so they're going to be able to issue compliance notices. Um, people might start being a tiny bit scared of them, which is, which is good. Um, they'll also be able to do binding access requests. So at the moment, one of the great areas I do quite a lot of advice on is, you know, what, if they've asked for information, what can we disclose? What exemptions can we can we um, rely on? It's kind of a it's kind of a, you know subjective we see you see kind of a position. So they will actually be able to delve into that and make binding orders. And also in terms of their investigative power, um, being able to go in and doing that. So that's probably the other biggest move in terms of New Zealand privacy law, at least in this round of changes. But of course, we do not just operate under New Zealand law, and um, I guess that's one of the larger focuses of today. Um, as I said, Australia um, did some quick changes to their uh, policy in 2012. So back around the time we did, they sort of started to talk about changes in our doing, uh, they did some. And then this year they brought in their mandatory reporting, so on February they find all that through. And as I said, they've got two tests, uh, different tests for commissioner versus individual. Quite a lot of exceptions to that. So it's never as simple as, oh, we had a breach, we must disclose. You, you do have to work your way through uh, the legislation and what steps you have to take. Um, in Europe, um, there's obviously been a really strong move uh, in the last um, decade, really, towards privacy. Um, back in 2011, the EU cookie directive came in, um, and it actually took quite a long time, perhaps because the fines were massive, um, for it to, to really get its way down. Um, to, to be visible to most people. That was where you know you go onto the site and you've got to click the little cross button to get in, or for it to really function properly, you can't see the front page. Um, it was reasonably um, uh, 
I would describe as reasonably benign disclosure at that point being required. So no time that you've got cookage, people could click on further and find out some more information. So definitely a step further, um, probably the most museum businesses do, although I think this is becoming more of a new norm that people should be um, thinking about even in New Zealand. Um, GDPR takes it a step further. And we'll look at consent shortly in terms of GDPR, but you'll notice now that those cookie um, sort of consent features are going to be unblocked, uh, I guess, more informative. Um, and the, the choices, which are hopefully for, for the really good compliers, will be easier for people to navigate in terms of real choice. So, GDPR. If you've been here for the last minute, you're excited to know what's coming. It's been. So, um, in case you missed it, the world didn't stop though, we also carried on fine. Um, but I uh, did notice that the first feeds into my uh, email box the next day were around um, the big uh, players in social media. Uh, I'm going to be the first taken to task. Not a surprise there. Um, and we'll get on to consent and why that is shortly. But um, what does it apply to? Well, it's really, really important. Personal data, um, back when I was a baby technology privacy lawyer, uh, we had these sort of notions of what privacy was, and uh, cookies and technology were reasonably dumb, to be honest. Um, you know, back when I was a, a young lawyer, uh, cookies we used to say didn't really do much for privacy, um, because they just made the website function. Now, you will be aware that they are much, much smarter than that, and it's by no um, sort of mean feed that uh, my Facebook status, which says engaged and has for a very long time, continues to tell me about when you play. That tracks you, it tracks you everywhere. So really, um, your ISP address, um, things that don't necessarily have your name on it, but do link you as you travel through uh, essentially the world um, on, on the web, is personal information. That lines up quite nicely with where New Zealand um, privacy lawyers have been advising for quite some time. Uh, we have quite a, 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 I describe it as a really wide funnel to get into our act. The definition of personal information is really wide. Australia has a slightly narrow area in, but you often get the same result. So our definition is very similar. Um, if it's been pseudonymized, I love that word, um, actually to the point where you can't reverse it, um, it's not personal data. But um, you've got to be careful about the fact that if you had the data that wasn't pseudonymized at, I mean, say, at the same time, at the beginning, then you have got personal data. So, you know, it's not as simple as, well, I'm going to sit on my mind, but therefore, you know, it was written out in the first place. Um, and we spoke about the fines being massive. My ad, though, you've got to be pretty naughty and pretty big to probably get those. <laughs> so, one of the other differences, I guess, in terms of trying to get your heads around GDPR and this, this sort of new world of privacy is some of the lingo. So, in New Zealand, we, we talk about our privacy at these different agencies. Ironically, not in the sense of agency in any sort of legal um, sense, just that's what they were called. Um, over in Australia, the, um, the, the, the entities, the agencies are the uh, public ones. Over in Europe, they use the concept of a controller and a processor, which kind of makes sense. Uh, a controller determines the uh, use and purpose, etc., and collection. They're basically in control. So that would be what most businesses in New Zealand would be when they consider the data their own, they're doing stuff with it. Processes are the people who do the stuff for the controllers, again, reasonably common sense. The minute uh, a processor starts doing stuff with the data that it hasn't been directly told to, it becomes a controller. So that's, I guess, another thing to just be aware of in terms of where your business might set itself. And obviously, uh, a business in one sense can be a controller, and in another sense could be a processor. Oh, not in Yes, okay, we're only one, one step over um, Okay. Processor, what is that? It's really, really broad. So when I say processor, don't think some magic has had to have happened to the data. Simply holding it is enough. Collecting it, holding it. Certainly if you're doing magic with it, um, that definitely is. But really, really simple, it's just holding it. In terms of the um, stuff under the GDPR, and I guess this is another move that's sort of moving us beyond kind of more New Zealand realm is that the controllers obviously have most of the obligations. A lot of principles that are very similar to say, New Zealand, the controller has to comply with. But under GDPR, the processor also has direct legal obligation. And that's a bit of a shift, really. Um, in New Zealand, if you are acting on somebody else's behalf, 100%. Section 3 generally makes the other person that you're doing it for responsible for your behaviour. Um, 
So it's a bit of a move. So how does it apply to New Zealand businesses? This is really a really complicated question we need to focus on to start with. Um, article 3 is a key one, and a lot of people go diving into GDPR and they read an article that says that um, if you have EU data, you must comply with G sorry, if you have EU data, you must comply with GDPR, which is not true, particularly for sitting in New Zealand. It means you should certainly start asking questions, and you should certainly start digging through, but it's not unnecessarily a direct relationship with just having some data. So Article 3, as you expect, first of all, if you are in the EU doing business, you might have people there, you might have a subsidiary, um, you might have a little office, what do you like? But actually, you consider yourself to be doing business there. Probably in a reasonably traditional sense, although it'll be interesting to see the case law that comes out. Again, this is all very new, so we're going strictly off the words in an act, which lawyers love to do. We like the case law to kind of flesh out, but at the moment it's just, it's literally guidance notes and the legislation itself. So that's pretty straightforward, and not that sort of it's surprising for most of businesses. If you think they're doing um, business in Australia, you should hopefully have some Australian legal advice, or you should have at least done a lot of Google in yourself. So uh, that's not a big step. The next step though is Article 3.2, and that applies where you've got processing of personal data of data subjects who are in the EU. So that's the first thing in the EU. Uh, question I get is. Um, so there's a couple of people in New Zealand who have moved here from the, from the EU. Does it catch them? No, it doesn't, don't count. Um, they are not EU data subjects for the purpose of GDPR. Um, by a control of process that not established here, so you haven't got caught by the first one, where the processing activities are related to one of these next two things. Now the first one is the offering of goods or service. Irrespective of where the payment is made, and that irrespective of payment is probably targeted at your likes of your social media, because you're not paying in cash, you're paying in yourself, um, to such data subjects in the union. And the second one is monitoring of the behaviour, again, of those individuals who are EU data subjects in the EU. So if you're monitoring them as they you know, travel around New Zealand in a camper van, no, it doesn't matter. They're not in the EU. Kind of clear at the moment? Excellent. So let's look at these a little bit deeper. These are sort of the common questions, and luckily there's been some pretty good guidance in terms of some of these. It's kind of a key question, you know, when you're trying to go for what the EU is with a bit of worldwide domination, which traditionally we're going to see in America trying to do. So the first one, that first uh, sort of sublim and second one, whether a non-EU business is offering goods or services to an EU data subject, and again, including for free. Um, so the guidance is very clear that it's the intent that's important. So if it's sort of really an ancillary, and you don't really aim to go there, and um, you, know, you can't stop someone coming to you because you're that good, well that's fine. It really is the intent, and that kind of makes sense. But how are they going to look at intent? They can't read your mind. Um, they have put out some quite, quite nice guidance really on, on what they would be looking at as trigger points. And if you want to avoid EU, which a few businesses are. I mean, some of you are going, well, okay, we're just going to have to suck it up and move our way along that direction. But some of you are going, well, actually, we don't, it's not a target. We don't want to go there. How do we avoid tripping up? Um, and this is where you need to be, um, to be thinking. If you've got an open website um, and you are not targeting, you're not going to get tripped up. The question is, is there something in your website that makes it more obvious that your users are actually trying to get EU data subjects there? Do you have an EU language version? So at the extreme of that particular instance, you've got a little German um, a couple who have moved to New Zealand and they've got a lovely b and in the middle of the uh, North Island, and they have usefully put up some text in German to maybe attract more people from their home to come. That would technically trip them up. Probably they'll be too busy trying to chase down some social media platforms to go after a little couple in the uh, middle of the for a while, but technically that will trip them as one of the indicators that they might be intending to essentially sell services to EU people. <coughs> um, another one offering an EU currency, uh, mentioning customers who are in the EU, uh, targeting EU citizens in some other way. So, an um, example that might be. Uh, actually, you've got quite a lot of um, sort of signage on maybe a, a, the main public transport system in one of the uh, EU cities. Uh, perhaps one of the main um, uh, media outlets. 
um, one of my newspapers, so call them newspapers, in terms of the EU, you might have advertising linking to your site from that. That's probably another indicator that you're actually trying to do business with EU people. Cool? Anybody think it's dropping right there? No? That's good. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, the second one, and this one's a little bit greyer, and what they're really aiming at is that stalking of me, reminding me of that I'm not being married. But the wording is quite, at this point, um, vanilla. Um, so at one extreme, um, cookies are not completely done, they're sort of a little bit further along, could trip this up at quite a technical level. So it's going to be an interesting area to watch. And this is the one that probably trip business up without even realising they're technically probably caught. You know, I wouldn't rush out to panic that they, the cavalry are going to come over to me to get you, um, but it's good to understand. So where a person's tracked on the internet, um, and it's about the behaviour while they're in the EU. This is going to trip you up, particularly, and this, is, this raises your risk profile tripping up on this one, if you're profiling and targeting them for it. So the more you're using their information and monitoring them to essentially make money in some way or shape or form, the higher up is the more you go for this. I mean, you can see what they're really targeting. Um, but at some levels, a lot of businesses are doing very valuable monitoring. Um, and again, that dubs back to the definition of personal data. If it's really just um, pseudo anonymized, you can't identify the individual at all, really. You've got a nice IP address, but it's very, very limited. Um, you're probably at the OK level. But the minute you are, have got some kind of login, you've got their name, you're starting to monitor their behavior just on the site, even, um, that trips you up. Again, it's just working your way up that risk profile. Otherwise, you might get caught. Um, so, New Zealand obviously has a great industry of uh, startups for awesome platforms, um, lots of software developers. They are often going to be processes, and if their customers are over in the EU, EU, they may be starting to get some inquiries, as some of my clients are, about are you uh, compliant with GDPR? And they go, GDPR? <laughs> We're in New Zealand. Um, so, if you are a processor, holding or doing something awesome with your awesome platform, uh, which involves uh, your customer being a controller. Those controllers are generally going to be in the EU, but remember some controllers are not in the EU, but they become a controller because of the EU data connection and their Article 3. Then you become a processor, no matter where you are in the world. So that's something that um, I think will slowly ripple um, more into New Zealand. I, I don't think we've seen quite the full extent of it yet. Um, and the important thing for that is not only will you be expected to have extra things in your contract, which will be manly drafting, um, but you will also have some direct obligations under EU law. Again, whether or not someone comes chasing you for them is a whole other seminar, but technically you will. Is anybody in that camp? So what does it mean? What is GDPR that's so different to New Zealand? Well, at a principles base, as you'll see from this slide and the next one, it's actually at a principles base not that different. And individual rights have gone quite a big step. Um, but when you just look at the high level principles, they are actually quite similar to our principles. You've got to process lawfully and fairly. Uh, you've got to uh, collect for specified purposes. That's a bit of a leak. So we have to collect for purposes and we have to kind of have this vague privacy policy that generally says some stuff. It's a lot more specific under the GDPR. Um, it has to only be adequate to the concept of data minimisation, so not collecting um, stuff that you really don't need, you've got no idea what you can do with it. And it has to be accurate, you've got to check this accurate for you. Mm -hmm. Those sort of principles are actually at that high level reflected in our privacy policy, sorry, in our Privacy Act. Um, but as you'll see, there's some quite big changes in terms of what they mean under the GDPR. We've also got um, a couple more principles that are very similar. Only keep it as long as you need it, and make sure you keep it safe. So that went around to legitimate sort of lawful purposes. Then we've got that in our, in our um, Act in New Zealand and somewhere in Australia. But what we've said for GDPR, and this is quite a big leap in Europe as well, is it actually has to be one of six specified things. And each of them has a whole week of law underneath it. And so for every single purpose that you use EU data, if 
you have to land the GPM. You've got to decide which one it is. You've got to choose. You've got to document yourself, and then you've got to tell the individual. Um, and we'll go through those six in a minute. But that's quite a big change, and it's uh, one of these ones is the one that's going to trip up most of the social media. Um, if your purposes change, you have to be quite careful as well, which is the data that we collected. Um, and that's all those constant stream of emails you have because the consent you gave was not good enough in the past, even if you gave it. Um, and interestingly, and, and this is where you do need to delve deeper into terms of, oh, don't just always choose this one, it seems easy. Depending on which of the six you choose, impacts on what rights an individual has in relation to their information. So for consent, for example, um, the person has to be able to withdraw their consent at any time. So if you're building this great, awesome um, platform where um, you're going to get everyone's consent, and it's going to be nice and clear, and somehow you can do it perfectly, but you are actually going to monetize the data, um, that could all fall over with you know, one bit of bad press about you and one withdrawing their notice uh, of, of consent. Um, there they are. So consent. As I said, it's quite a big move, consent. No longer are the days where you can just have your hyperlink at the bottom of your privacy policy. Um, in terms of um, opt-in, it's very, very, very clear to see that it has to be a thing people must take the opt-in. You can't get pre-opt in and you certainly can't send out and say, if you don't hear from you, we'll deem that to be. There's none of that. So it's a very, very specific opt-in. The thing that's tripping up the likes of um, the social media platforms is that it's appreciate most of their business model is now based on uh, they offer you something and in return you don't pay cash, you give them everything about you. Um, that's essentially how they work. Uh, so the consent under GDPR has to be very specific. And it has to be um, ability to opt in and opt out of everything. And unless it's actually necessary for the service, and we will eventually see where that test heads, people have to be able to opt out. So you can't say to have my service, you must agree to this, if it's not directly linked to how the service has to operate. So that's, if you've seen anything with press around um, social media platforms, that's where you're all falling over. Contract, another one, so quite simply, I've given you something, you know, I've given you my data to look after, well of course I've given you my data to look after, that is, that is the agreement. Uh, legal obligations, obviously if you've got um, particularly public authorities or if you've got some legal obligation to collect, like the likes of AIM, uh, use money laundering, all those sorts of things. If it's vital to say somebody's life, um, public interest, so these are often kind of exceptions you see in New Zealand kind of law as well. The other big one is legitimate interests. Um, it gives you quite a lot of rights, so somebody can't just turn around and change their mind on the legitimate interests because they never actually consented. But there is quite a big um, sort of test that you've got to go through to rely on this one. Um, you have to weigh up your need to have the information with their rights, and it's always to be balanced. So there is, it's not quite a simple fact that so we're not going to get consent because we need a legitimate business interest. So there is actually a test to follow through on it. A lot of those um, six have the word necessary in them. And as I say, with a sort of social media platform, um, probably the only ones who are going to go through the court systems first, I imagine. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where that lands, how necessary it is necessary. Um, the guidance at the moment there on the screen, it's got to be a target in a proportionate way of achieving purpose. So it doesn't have to be the only way, but it's got to be, I guess, balanced. Uh, if you could reasonably achieve it with sort of lower level of, I guess, invasiveness on privacy, you should choose that option. As I say, the, the six that you choose leads to the rights. I'm not going to go into those other than that's something to think about when you go going through that analysis. And there's one other thing, which is probably closer to Australian law than New Zealand law. So in New Zealand, we don't have any kind of special category of data that's, that's um, given extra rights, except under the codes. So we do have a health information code and credit reporting codes, we have those. Those largely um, spell out the same aspects of the Privacy Act, but just for some really beautiful examples. Um, there's a little bit of extra law in there, but it's not, it's not massive. Um, Australia has a sensitive um, information, and they have extra things that you have to deal with over there for that. As in our GDPR. Um, European law has always also had the concept, but they've added to the list. It's things like sex, um, sexual preference, um, marital status, um, so health, um, genetics, so a lot of the genetic stuff. So it's going into that um, stuff that really isn't sensitive about you. Individual rights. So um, GDPR is a bit different in the 
that it really does focus on people having rights versus a business having obligations. It's kind of a different way of looking at privacy. The concept that people now are, you know, a bit more ownership of their own data. So it's a, it's a bit of a reframing versus New, New Zealand's framing. Some of these are quite similar though, you know, right to be informed. That's that concept that you should be told what you're going to do. Um, New Zealand have got our privacy notices under Article 3. Here, um, the GDPR preference is um, certainly to go a lot more transparent. The, um, the notices, if anyone has, did anyone actually click on any of the notices when they were clicking yes, I want to receive all your mail? So they're going to be a lot longer. Um, they're going to be um, uh, done with a lot of hyperlinks so they don't appear so long so that you can work your way through them. But generally, there's a lot more specific um, disclosure and a lot more things. I'll go through the list very quickly in terms of what you have to disclose. The other difference. In New Zealand, you only have to disclose when you're collecting from somebody the information. In Australia and under GDPR, you um, also need to disclose within a reasonable period of time if you collect information from somebody else about a person. That's quite a different thing to New Zealand. So you can see how the privacy policy is going to get quite long. Um, right to rectification, very similar to, to New Zealand. Um, right to erasure. It's a little bit broader, obviously the right to remove data, but this is the whole right to be forgotten, which you might have seen some press around. It's going to be interesting to see how businesses deal with it, you know, with um, backup tapes. The oh, high tech goes, I have to go, it's going to be at least once. Um, the questions that you're getting are quite practical questions. Well, how, are you, how do we do this? We've got backup tapes. Um, you know, we've got, we've got stuff stored. Um, so the practical steps to comply are going to be quite interesting. Um, right to restrict processing, right to data portability. It's that concept which is coming from Australia, actually, particularly in banking um, sectors in, in Australia, around the concept that the data is mine, and if I want to go to another provider, that information is really useful to me for getting a good deal, for all sorts of things. So I should go and move it. Um, be interesting to see whether that comes from New Zealand. There's a few places of making its way down here. Um, the right to object to doing certain things. Um, Another big change is in terms of the information of decision making. So they've realised that this is quite a high risk area, particularly where it's going to have quite significant consequences for an individual, potentially legal or rather reasonably big stuff. Um, what we're saying is you, you can't just do it willy nilly. Um, you are going to have to have people available. So the whole computer says no, you've got nowhere to go. It's just not what they want to see. So there's a whole other stuff on that. Any questions at this point? Um, so, as I said, right to be informed, that is that concept that now we're going to be telling you a heck of a lot more. I think I've got colour on that actually. And the list. So, in New Zealand, Article 3, which creates essentially the checklist for our privacy policies, has seven items. One of them hardly ever comes up. That's the one about if there's a law you have to tell them that it's voluntary and true. So, it kind of often ends up at six. Um, and we can get that down pretty short. Um, I challenge you to get this down pretty short. Um, it's going to be longer. Um, and you can see the, the, the various things you have to put in there. Um, particularly around, you know, religion and purpose, um, being one of those six. And potentially you may have to mention more than one, most of the price of policies under our have more than one. So what else do you have to do? You've got your privacy policy, and I think a lot of focus at this point is on the privacy policies. People are going, ah, GDPR, what do we do? Let's update our privacy policy. So that is the first um, sort of thing you will see occurring, which we've all seen. Um, what actually has to happen, really, and what should have happened before um, people updated their privacy policy was quite a lot of internal work to work out what on earth they did. Um, so the concept of actually mapping your data and recording it is kind of a key thing that should have happened, which I'm sure a lot of businesses are now madly scrambling to do. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see more privacy policies being updated later, but actually um, probably more reflection of reality. Um, another area of accountability though is contracts. And I think that's the next bit that we see more and more of. So first of all, let's get our privacy policy beautiful, make it look as though we're complying with GDPR. The second one is, oh, we've got all these processes, we must make sure we've got the right contracts in place. And there's um, a specific list, I think it's Article 28 or 29, um, that has a list of things that have to go on. Um, there are some model clauses floating around that are quite um, legalistic. Um, we've drafted a few more as well. And there's going to be various um, iterations that coming through. So if you are a processor in New Zealand and you are getting um, calls to action from your controllers around the world, um, this is one of the first things that they absolutely have to comply. As a processor, you don't have to, but your controllers should not give you data if you, if you don't. They are in breach. The 
The other bit around um, the, the sort of next step is the, is the big like, documentation behind the scenes, right? There's a whole heap around knowing where your data is um, and put processes and procedures in place. So the, there's so many data rights now in terms of um, you rights of access to information of, and the fines are massive. So businesses that are more than a couple of people um, are going to need to make sure all of their people know what to do when someone asks for something. Um, know what to do when there's a data breach. Um, and so the next sphere of work a lot of businesses are doing, this sort of thing as well, is around getting those policies and procedures in place. The New Zealand businesses are quite a timely reminder to do not only GDPR, but also, oh, we've got data that's Australia, and oh, we've got obviously New Zealand data. And so um, what I would probably promote for New Zealand businesses is coming up with a, particularly if you're going to be based here, um, policy that reflects all of the different jurisdictions that we run. Um, you have to maintain quite a lot of records. In terms of if you are um, caught properly for GDPR, um, one of the regulatory agencies over there, and you've got to actually, if you're complying properly, you're supposed to work out which one relates to you. It's quite a difficult question if you're sitting in New Zealand and you, you don't really think it should relate to you at all to work out which um, EU state you most bond to. Um, we can talk about that one afterwards. Um, but you, you actually have to make your records available, so it's sort of that you come in a little bit, and again, fines if you don't meet them. Again, we'll be interested to see um, in terms of whether they do go after some of those bigger New Zealand businesses. I think most of the bigger ones are going to be compliant um, because the fines are so big, it's on radar. Um, to start with, I think they're going after the US um, entities. Um, some of the other concepts, um, and if you've ever been to my privacy and text with seminars before, a lot of these are concepts that are quite old, but they've never really been um, in uh, law before. So the concept that you do privacy by design was actually um, back in the sort of 1990s uh, out of Canada. The concept that you uh, put privacy first when you're designing things, that you don't have it as a sort of final checklist. But this has actually been a trend through the GDPR. And the concept of doing a privacy impact statement, um, particularly where you are dealing with more high risk um, use of data, so when you're dealing with data, I guess a test for it is a high risk is put your data which you can get. That's a really good first test. It's not the legal test, um, but you know you do have to dig deeper. If actually inherently you as a person you would, would want to know what was going on and, and have been for that. Um, data protection officers, you might have heard this one as well. So they are having to be appointed in certain circumstances. Not every business that has to comply with GDPR has to appoint one. Um, it's kind of easy to be one and kind of not. Um, you have to understand GDPR, but you also have to be not um, a driving force for controlling in terms of data decisions. So for a small New Zealand business that goes, okay, right, sweet, we are fully doing data stuff, so we've got to fully get in there, and you've only got three of you, and you're all owning the business, pointing one of you as a data controller could be quite difficult, um, because yes, you've got great knowledge, so you take a few of the boxes in terms of knowing what's going on in the business, but because you can make decisions about the data, you're not objective. So, um, that's a really interesting one. There are data um, protection officers, um, sort of services popping up, um, and that might be a choice for those ones who, who know they must comply, but, but really none of them, none of the three of them are sitting in somebody's house is the right person. Um, big organisations um, are going to find it easier, and probably should and would already have privacy officers who would probably give themselves to go on their way. But they will have to ask them. Some other areas where um, there's a bit of a move to children start up, particularly in the social media space, is getting um, got under, under the um, magnifying glass of the GDPR. So the concept of um, needing parental consent and how you get that and how you prove that is um, quite key. Uh, in uh, the year, it's, it's 13, so your uh, kids are going to pretend to be you, essentially, to, to get the social media platforms they love. Um, we talked about reporting data breaches for New Zealand and for Australia, um, also over there. They have got um, the concept that it's likely to result in risk to the rights and freedoms. So again, a different test for 72 hour, I think it's a nice search for Australia. Um, anyway, all different time zones, which I don't have in front of me. The key with this is if you've got data around the world, you're going to need to start thinking about the hopefully not inevitable of a data breach occurring. And the main thing I think with data breach um, planning is having a culture where people will tell you. Because the worst thing that can happen is that a data breach occurs and no one says anything. 
Um, so really inherently it's, it's that cultural thing that's going to have to start happening. Um, and if you can start it happening now, uh, by the time it hits New Zealand, even if GDPR is available to you, um, you'll be well on the way. One of the other things is around this concept of representative within the EU. Have you heard of this one? There's um, businesses popping up to be your representative. Um, at not two or something like these. Um, again, there's a test as to whether or not you have to be appointing one. Um, if you are heavily into data, um, then you probably would, but there is a, a test to work your way through. Um, they basically are just somebody there that if the, um, one of the agencies wants to talk to you, they can contact. It's kind of a little bit artificial when you're hiring someone there, when actually on your website you've got your, you know, your 500 number. Um, they could just give you a bell, but, but that's how they're doing it. And part of it is, a, and part of the debate at the moment in terms of, of what um, <coughs> is personal responsibility that person will have as you rep, um, in terms of funding up a course if you don't, uh, is yet to be tested. The fees are probably going to go up if all of a sudden a representative um, does end up more on the hook than that, thinking that will be at the moment. So what do we do? You're sitting here, you've got, okay, First of all, Article 3 test, does the business have to comply? Really important to work through. If you sort of thought it was a no then, you may find that you are because you are a processor for someone who has worked out for their controller. How do you go towards GDPR compliance? Um, first thing is to order the data. And given the way where, I guess, privacy worldwide is going, it's a really good thing. And you can't start, um, as I say, drafting your privacy policy notices and, um, uh, and working out your internal policies until you've actually worked out what data you've got. So it's a really good time to work out if you should do this under the other key message. The privacy notices that I find are very out of date, even for New Zealand. So I still get privacy notices which say um, uh, we don't collect any personal information uh, on, on copies. Um, so that's really out of date now. I would query anyone who's still got that in there, but you'll find a lot of businesses do because. Um, you know, when it's just a slap on the back of the list with a wet bus ticket, most people don't spend money updating them. Um, so it would be timely to even bring it forward from New Zealand standards. Um, procedures, particularly around that access um, request, disclosure request, um, you know, access and deletion. If you are in New Zealand, those rights apply, and you need to make sure your business is the donor, and the fines are going up in New Zealand. So just putting in place those for New Zealand, the impacts for Australia, and maybe even GDPR as well if, if you have to comply with that. Consent. In New Zealand, the hyperlink on the bottom of the uh, website is probably okay for the website, probably. Uh, but the uses that people actually put to it, how many times do you, does your business refer to this mysterious privacy policy? Um, which probably uh, in the first paragraph says uh, this um, privacy policy applies to information collected through the website, so it automatically doesn't actually work with all those other uses that you're now referring to it. Um, so update those. Um, and um, with consent, at the moment, we're kind of getting there with opt-in for the um, scan app for if you want to see more marketing. Um, I think um, New Zealand's pretty, uh, pretty on board with that. You have to get people to actually do something positive to opt in to market to them. Um, where privacy is heading is that it's going to become the way we have to get consent for everything. If GDPR is uh, where you have to go, then there's six local bases for processing are a really key thing to you here around. They're not simple, I could spend an hour just on them. Um, third parties, if you're a controller, you need to have things in your contract. Um, if you are doing uh, transfers between jurisdictions, um, there are also the key things to think about. Children, obviously a quite sensitive area. Um, and data breaches. Again, even if you're just having to comply with the new, new New Zealand laws, and certainly if now you also do business in Australia, um, that's a key area to get your head around and have policies in place. Um, you don't have very long as well, I think that's a key message. It's a really short time frame, and that's when the business becomes aware, which isn't when management becomes aware, it's when the business becomes aware. Those constant concepts of data protection by design and, and, and privacy impact assessments, essentially making privacy something you do right at the beginning rather than right at the end. And it's quite a different design concept, I think, for most, um, most New Zealand businesses. Um, very few would even have privacy as an actual sort of, I guess, audit trail checkbox. Um, some of the bigger organisations might now, but very few 
um, who really want to go early enough in the process. Um, again, blood protection officers, whether you need to have one or not, you can look at some of you, it's going to be a key decision. Um, in which EU state is quite, I guess I say, it's quite a difficult question for the of New Zealanders who are caught by Article 3.2. They don't have an establishment there, um, which EU state actually applies to them. 